Thank you very much and uh, <clears throat> welcome. I, I, I'd like to say that um, I thought that yesterday's discussions were really stimulating um, and a number, of, an, an, a number of really important issues were raised. I want to try and make a few connection points to yesterday, if I can, and what I've, what I've wanted to say to try and join it up a little bit. Um, I, I, I titled uh, what I wanted to talk about, Listening to the South. So it might sound a little strange to you that I'm going to start by talking about Manchester. Um, That's the South. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, but I'll come to the point a bit later on. So let me start by talking about Manchester, and then, 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 then I hope you'll realise why I'd, I did call this Listening to the South. I mean, first of all, um, a little bit of c context. Um, and I, when I went for a walk early this morning around Brighton, I thought how appropriate it would be to say this, because although I was born in this, in this part of the world, I've been privileged to live um, in Manchester and Salford for the past four years, and it really is a very different place in all sorts of respects. And it's stunning how different the north of England is becoming from the south in all sorts of ways. And it's something maybe we should also be concerned about when we think about a, a, a national, in this case, English, uh, higher education system. Um, but Manchester, of course, um, was a highly significant city in the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's the city, uh, Salford is the city that uh, Engels came to, uh, to learn how to be a mill owner uh, from his father. Um, the, the, the pub, um, the Crescent just down the road from my office, is where Marx and Engels met to drink. Um, and you can still uh, retrace uh, Engels' steps across the centre of Manchester that he describes uh, in his book on the uh, English working class of the 1840s. Um, it was the heart of uh, the empire in many respects. At one stage, three quarters of Britain's GDP was generated in the Manchester-Liverpool area. And of course, the, 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 the basis of the economy for Manchester, and I'll come on in a minute to the relevance of this point, uh, was the import of uh, raw cotton uh, from the colonies and the empire, largely from India, the conversion of that into manufacturers' goods and the sale of the clothing as a result back to the colonies is a very considerable uh, premium, with a fair bit of the slave trade in between as well. So um, very much the hub of the 19th century um, economy. Today, um, in Greater Manchester, which is 10 local um, areas, authority areas, uh, there are more than 150 languages spoken. 30% of the population of Greater Manchester was actually born outside of the UK. Uh, and two-thirds of all children of school age in Greater Manchester are bilingual, or at least bilingual. Um, so in many respects, um, I see Manchester and Salford as one of those uh, archetypal contemporary cities, contemporary world cities, uh, that stand apart uh, from the rest of the world. And if you think about Britain today, uh, and you think of Britain in terms of four or five major cities outside London. I'm obviously thinking about Newcastle, Leeds, she Sheffield, Birmingham, those sorts of areas. They are so very, very different from the rest of the country that we're seeing a national discourse, I think, about immigration, about curriculum, about the sense of nation, which is completely out of touch with what's actually happening in the major urban areas of our country. And our major urban areas are now far more similar, I think, in a lot of the issues that they face to world cities elsewhere, cities like uh, New York, cities like Lagos, uh, cities like uh, Calcutta. Um, a, a very useful phrase that I picked up um, from Homi Baba, who gave a, a very interesting uh, address to uh, the Going Go Global Conference in London a couple of years ago. He talked about the challenge of our cities today as learning to live side by side with strangers. And he used the term side by side uh, quite deliberately. Um, in what he said. And uh, Barber framed that as a challenge uh, for the humanities in our contemporary world. And I found that very useful thinking about my university's mission in a city like Salford, in an area like Manchester, in a region uh, like the Northwest. Now my contention there would be that if you take that contemporary urban condition and you think about the cities that we live in, uh, the humanities and the scholarship that comes with the humanities are absolutely central to that contemporary condition. You can't really understand the dynamics of living in that sort of environment without the particular insights and skills that come from the humanities. 
Now, in my own discipline, I come to that as an archaeologist and as an urban and industrial archaeologist, and so I'm particularly interested in the material manifest manifestation of that, in the way that the urban environments that we've created, which are palimpsests of hundreds of years often, uh, create and shape that sort of environment and shape identities and shape who we are and who people are. And I see our cities actually as complex sets of contradictions uh, that can't really be resolved and possibly we shouldn't try to resolve. But that's just one disciplinary dis uh, discourse on our contemporary urban condition, our contemporary living condition. Sociology, of course, is central to that. You can't really begin to understand uh, our contemporary condition in cities without the skills of the sociologist. Literature and creative writing, central to that, central to identity, central to expression. Our cities are cauldrons of creativity uh, in all sorts of ways, uh, running through all the creative arts. Wonderful here to be in a building uh, with uh, what I take to be a final year art exhibition going off and on in the hallway. Always fascinating insights into the creativity of universities. If you happen to stumble across a university towards the end of year show uh, of, uh, the, uh, of, of the art department, it gives you a real insight into the perception of all those people who are drawing into the, into the university, the way that they see their world and the way that they express their world and the way that they challenge their world in the forms of the creative arts. You can't really imagine understanding the contemporary urban condition without the languages, without modern languages. And it's surely a national tragedy and something that we need to worry about that is so very, very difficult now to keep language departments going in many of our universities. We are facing a crisis in modern language teaching in our contemporary universities. Uh, and many of our language departments are soon going to be forced to close because we have a simple, straightforward, catastrophic decline of students. And some of our universities, our applications into our language courses are sitting at one third of what they should be. Uh, Britain is a country that seems to think collectively that if you speak English load, loudly and slowly to a stranger anywhere in the world, they must be able to understand you. And if you look in contrast to the way, for instance, young adults are coming out in other parts of the world as truly bilingual, um, countries, of course, like the United States, where it's absolutely common now to be fluent in Spanish, uh, but if you look uh, at uh, the rise of China, the importance of Mandarin, the significance of Arabic as a modern language, the ability of people on what quaintly we tend to call the continent uh, to uh, speak a variety of languages very easily. It's something we're not going to be thanked for in future generation. And above all of that, of course, the abilities for critical analysis, which is what I take to be central uh, to the humanities, the ability to apply critical theory uh, in appropriate ways uh, to really understand what's going on. And we saw some of that in that wonderful video yesterday uh, that we saw where we saw staff teachers explaining to students how they should actually take apart images uh, and to understand how images are being used, to think critically about the world around them, to question. I'm certainly going to take that video and use it uh, for staff seminars in my university. It's one of the best examples I've seen of getting inside what should actually happen in a learning situation. So that's what I take to be, if you like, our modern condition. And I don't think, I don't particularly want to overprivilege cities because, of course, huge things happen outside cities of particular importance. But you can't imagine understanding our contemporary condition, our recent history, and our future trajectories without understanding what is happening in these really complicated urban environments. So, listening to the South, this is where I come to my, uh, my, 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 my title. You, you, you could possibly deduce, by the way, that I speak, that I spent a significant amount of my career in South Africa. Um, and I was privileged to be at the University of Cape Town for a considerable amount of time and had the opportunity there to encounter uh, a whole stratum of intellectual thought uh, and creativity, which is coming out of many countries in Africa, which is simply not making it into the mainstream intellectual discourse because of the way the political economy of publication and journals and the circulation of knowledge works. And many people here will know that and appreciate that and will have benefited from those sorts of insights, not necessarily from Africa, but also from intellectuals working in South America, intellectuals working in India, other parts of Asia, China, for example. There's a whole world out there that's actually out of the circulation of knowledge that we conventionally use because of the overprivilege of English and because of the way the political economy of the distribution of our journals works. But if you step back a little bit and look at some of the really interesting work that's coming out now on future economic trajectories, um, what is clear 
is that over the next, over the next uh, 5 to 10 to 15 years, there is going to be considerable continuing inward migration into major cities in the south, and that's going to drive the world economy. We're already seeing a situation uh, where economic growth is shifted away from America, away from Europe. We now seem to celebrate wildly in Britain if we get an economic quarter with 0.3% economic growth. Um, uh, it's, we're a long, long way away from 2006, 2007, aren't we? Um, and we simultaneously criticize countries uh, at the same time uh, if their economic growth slows from 9% to 6%. Uh, we talk about them being in decline, which is a very interesting uh, way of expressing our relative situations. Um, but the combination of these uh, consistent year-on-year -year economic growth figures of 5% or more, combined with the information society and economy and the way that economic centres are developing, means that over the next 5 to 10 years, we are going to see a significant number of cities in the South who are, which are going to have populations of more than 20 million people. Um, now, there are very few cities at the moment that come close to that. I think Shanghai is pretty well there. But we're going to see cities like Johannesburg, cities like Lagos, Calcutta, uh, growing into these mega centers of population. They're not going to have conventional infrastructures. They're going to be doing things differently. Uh, and they're going to create a dynamic uh, that's going to shape uh, the future of the world. Um, and we need to understand how the humanities will drive our understanding um, of uh, that uh, particular sort and sense of direction. Um, so what should we do about, how, how can we actually understand how we can reframe the humanities uh, as central to what we're doing in our university? I need to put my hand up here uh, because this is where as I come to one of my own contradictions, uh, which is having a set of responsibilities for running my institution while also trying to be involved in these sorts of conversations. And were um, um, members of my own branch of the UCU sitting here now, they'd, they'd be now be frowning and looking at me quizzically uh, because they would be knowing uh, that I'm having great difficulty in keeping humanities going at my own university. So let me declare straight away that I'm having a great deal of difficulty in keeping humanities subjects going at the University of Salford. I have to say that in a situation where we are faced uh, with, and this is where I was puzzled by Will Hutton's statements yesterday, certainly less autonomy than we've ever had before, with very tight student number control, quorum margin, shifts away from us, other universities in the Russell Group dropping their A-level grades uh, by three or four degrees. Um, it is very, very difficult to get the applications that we need in universities like mine to keep core humanities subjects going. Um, and I put my hand up straight away and say there are things I am going to have to do that I really don't want to do, but which I have to do for the economic survival of the institution. And I take my hat off to people at the University of Brighton uh, who found a way of tackling that 25 years ago, and I think it's a notable uh, achievement. But let's look a little bit then uh, at what that situation is. Now, going back to the circulation of knowledge, I think there is a really important question uh, about how we look to the way knowledge is distributed. Um, I talked earlier about the economy of Manchester being based um, on the import uh, of cotton and the export of uh, developed materials. I think we do the same today intellectually. We import uh, raw data from research fields. We export theory. So the classic uh, grant uh, that's gained when you know you have to have an international partner, well, what do you do if you're, a Brit if you're a university in Britain? Well, you go and find some university in Africa to partner with uh, that can host you where you go and collect the raw material. Uh, you collect all the data, you bring it back, you refine it into theory, and then you export it again at books that sometimes will cost the, the equivalent of the entire salary of a lecturer in Kenya. So if you look at the political economy of what's going on in universities in East Africa, East Africa is providing a disproportionate amount of raw data to the medical sciences, for example, uh, where the same ethics do not necessarily apply in terms of data protection. That information is being collected. It's being taken back to universities in Britain. It's being turned into theory. And it's then being sold back in very expensive books, uh, which literally do come to more than the, the average monthly salary of a lecturer at the University of Kenya in Nairobi. It seems to me awfully like uh, the imperial trade of the 19th century. Um, and that's why I would like to put up my hand in defense um, of open access and open publishing, um, which I think, and I mean there's been a lot of complex debate about this, and this is something that we really need to talk about, um, but for me, and the reason why I am passionate about open access publishing, 
why I was involved in the Finch group, for example, which again is usually enough to get you banned from meetings. Um, but one of the reasons why I've been involved in that and continue to be involved in that is because I do believe uh, that open access gives us opportunities to break out of that political economy which restricts the distribution of knowledge and which not only opens up um, curriculum in interesting ways from the north to the south, but gives us an opportunity to benefit from the extraordinary richness of intellectual activity in the south that's not now easily available uh, because people are not able to get it into circulation. So it's not some patronizing process of giving those in the South our developed intellectual goods. It's a process of receiving from the South intellectual knowledge about the conditions of life that I think have huge insights uh, into uh, our way of life. And one of the interesting experiences of coming from Cape Town to Salford is in fact how similar Salford is to Cape Town and how similar the challenges are. So for example, in Cape Town, the variation of life expectancy uh, between a township like Kyalicha and the uh, suburbs and on, on the edge of Table Mountain, the variation of average life expectancy is about 15 years, which is lamentable. It is lamentable that anybody uh, should have an expectation of life 15 years less in sight of somewhere. Coming to Manchester and comparing South Manchester, which is where the footballers live, uh, to North Manchester, where 60 to 70 percent people are out of work, the variation of life expectancy is 10 years. And that's on the back of the National Health Service. I think it's deplorable that there should be a variation in life expectancy of 10 years across a city in Britain that has in common the benefits of the National Health Service. You can translate that directly into education. We're now, now, now we're now in a situation, and I got this from David Willits's book, we're now in a situation where you can predict the number of years that a child will be in education from its weight at birth. So think about that. So the nutritional condition of the mother, which relates, of course, to the household income, is a predictor statistically of the number of years her child will spend in education. So what's so different uh, between the North and the South? Now turning, and, and these, this is the end of what I, I, I want to say, one of the things that I've found, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and offer some sort of um, magisterial solution to all of these things that would be extremely pretentious. But one of the things that I have found very helpful in trying to organize my thoughts in how we relate what happens in the university to these sorts of challenges is to start thinking in, in terms of individual stories uh, and life histories, which I think are very interesting and useful ways of connecting the individual to the experience of theory and the experience of what we're trying to, trying to do uh, in uh, a university. And, and I thought that Jill Scott's presentation yesterday hit that exactly on the nail. Because what I saw her doing there was demonstrating the importance of a general principle of curriculum. The point, for instance, about joining things up, avoiding the discordances of modularity, trying to get to multidisciplinary. These are, these are very important general principles that we debate. The danger of debating them in general is that we lose sight of the student or the person behind them. And I think expressing it that way, where you go down into the lived experience of students who are interviewed on video, and you see what that means for them in terms of their own emerging critical consciousness, begins to tell us what the humanities are about. So I find that a very useful approach. And um, I've, I've come, it, it seems to, it, it is strange how scarce, rich, longitudinal studies of these sorts of experiences actually are. Um, one very important one that I've come across, and I'd be delighted to know about more, is Rachel Thompson's work on inventing adulthoods. Uh, and I think that's a really rich corpus of material. Uh, fascinating stories, and again, really hard work. I think a, a, a 10 to 15 year trajectory is being tracked, showing how uh, young adults emerge through the school system, how they acquire their learning, how their class position comes into play in terms of their preferences, how things that Amartya Sen would call adaptive preferences kick in, and I know about that from Salford. Those are the adaptations that individuals make that lower their aspirations. So if I can translate that into my vernacular, it's young people, usually age of 14 and 15 in Salford, saying, university's not the likes for me. No one in our family goes for university. That's an adaptive preference. A person, however intelligent, has taken themselves out already before they even get close. Uh, universities like mine, universities like the University of Brighton, 
that take uh, widening participation seriously know that we have to reach deep back into the schooling system if we're going to tackle uh, those issues. Uh, and so Rachel Thompson's work, I thought, in Inventing Adulthoods does just that. It takes us back into those formative years. And of course, in that study, it shows us how all the skills and the insights of the knowledge making of the humanities come to play. A an example um, that um, uh, uh, from, from, from my South African life, if you like, um, is some remarkable work by Rochelle Kapp and uh, Bongi Bangani, who have done a similar sort of study uh, with uh, young adults entering the University of Cape Town for the first time. And again, it shows you that sense of alienation. So what, what they're doing is interviewing young black South Africans who are the first in their family uh, to come into higher education. Rather than being romantic experiences that we often talk about, these are often deeply unsettling and contradictory experiences. So characteristically, for example, a young black South African um, who starts off fully integrated into a uh, rural village surrounding comes to a place like the University of Cape Town. They acquire knowledge. They speak differently. They're never fully accepted into the new university environment, which is still largely structured by race and gender, irrespective uh, of its external sort of experiences. But after a year, they are too posh for the village. They speak differently. They're not accepted back home. And they're trapped in an extremely dangerous and lonely space between moving from one to the other. And moving away from romantic notions, that's probably what uh, class uh, mobility or social mobility feels like and looks like uh, when people are undertaking it. And if you're of a certain age, which is my certain age, Many of you who are of my certain age around here will have been first in family yourselves to go uh, to university because by definition you would have gone to university in the late 60s or early 70s where participation rates were far, far lower. I went to the University of Cambridge. I was one of only two grammar school boys going into my particular year in Cambridge and I can totally remember how there was not a single day I was left to forget the fact of where I came from. And it was in how I ordered a drink, how I ordered my social life, the way that I spoke. You were reminded constantly of your class position. And what I think happens with people moving in these socially mobile ways, which is what Rochelle and uh, Bongi are, are looking at in the Cape Town study and what, which, 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 which is being looked at in Rachel Thompson's work, is how that space evolves. A very difficult, lonely space that you need all the skills and insights uh, of, a, of, of a university to deal with, and you need all the skills and insights of the humanities disciplines to understand and to, to track. So I'll stop at that point, um, because what I hope I've done is connect together some of the dynamics of teaching, some of the dynamics of creating a learning environment, which is our mission in the university uh, to create the best possible educational experience, with our mission in the humanities of deep critical thought and insight, bringing to play these interdisciplinary, long-established disciplinary methods to understand what's going on, to get us perspective, to create new knowledge, which I think is central for our condition now and will be central for our condition in the future. So I hope that is helpful. Thank you.